Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm reading verses 19 down to 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. I have been seeking to bring to your attention the surpassing greatness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as we have since the middle of January begun making our way through the book of Hebrews. We come today to a key transition point. The writer has been laboring and bringing to us again and again how Jesus Christ is unparalleled. There is none like him. It isn't that he has close rivals, but that he is the leader of the pack. He outdistances them all by the farthest margin. Jesus Christ is the one and the only. He is utterly unique in his person as well as in the work which he has accomplished for us. But we come to this place where we are no longer talking about that bedrock and those fundamentals on which we build. Rather, there is a transition into what is it that we now are called to do. And so I title this, What is to be Done? What is to be done? But first of all, the writer cannot miss the opportunity to once again point out that Jesus Christ is the one who has brought us to our standing. Lest there be any mistake whatsoever, Jesus Christ and He alone is the reason why we have the salvation which we enjoy and why we can now enter in and, part and partner with God and participate with God in what He desires to see accomplished. I have had opportunity again and again as people have questioned, how is it that works and the gift of God tie together? Never miss the opportunity to say it for the blessing and the benefit of those round about you. We are not saved by works, but we are saved to good works. We are not saved by anything that we have done, but that does not eliminate that having come to enjoy salvation, that we are to lay back and to do utterly nothing at all. We begin with verse 19 in this passage. Therefore, brethren, interesting that just as with Paul when he spoke to the renegade Corinthians who ignored his apostleship and his authority and downplayed him so horribly, yet he spoke to them and he appealed to them as brothers he appealed to them as those within the family of God. And here, these who were thinking of drawing away and pulling back from Christ, there is yet that tenderness, there is yet that appeal within the family. 
Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, we have confidence. That is something that is not known in other religions of this world. There is a hope so, there is a might be so, I wish it so, but we have. This distinguishes us, this sets us apart in that in Christ and the offering that He made once for all, we now have a confidence and whereby we previously, Gentiles all of us I think, whereby previously we were excluded and were on the outside looking in. You recall that that temple in Jerusalem, just as the tabernacle in the wilderness, a Gentile would be on the farthest periphery. Jewish women a little farther in, Jewish men, the Levites, the priests, the high priest, to that center room, the Holy of Holies, which contained the Ark of the Covenant. But now, having the veil torn apart, a picture when Christ died of how that the access and the opportunity to come has been opened to us and we have confidence. Confidence. Now, it's one thing to enter into a courtroom confidently, and it's a very different thing to enter in not knowing at all what's going to happen there. We are told that because of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice which He made, it has granted us confidence. We don't come into the presence of God like the brothers of Joseph trembling and wondering what is going to happen here. We are not clothed in our own filthy rags anymore, but we are clothed in the white garments of Christ. Garments that are undefiled and unstained. And so we come into the very presence of God, not brazenly or brash, but we come with a confidence because of that offering which was made on our behalf by a new and living way which He, again pointing to Him and Him alone, the soul, the solitary one who worked the work, which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His blood. And since we have a great, high, a great priest over the house of God, which has been shown to us in all of His splendor, working, interceding on our behalf at the very throne of God. Considering all of this, there are now four things which are held out to us, and the key words are, let us. Those are repeated three times, but I would bring to your attention that it is implied in verse 25, and so really it's four times that we are told, let us, let us. Go with me, please, to John chapter 6. And Jesus is dialoguing, he's conversing with some Jews. And I begin reading in verse 26, Jesus answered these people, these Jews, and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of God will give to you, for on him everything is focused on Jesus. For on Him, the Father, God, has set His seal. Now the people ask. Therefore they said to Him, What shall we do? What shall we do that we may work the works of God? 
These people, they had heard time and again about the work that they were to do, the ceremonies that they were to fulfill, and the obligations of the law. And so there was ingrained in them a work mentality. And so they come to Jesus and they are warmed, they are, they are intrigued by what He has to say and the message that He brings. But they couch this in terms of work. And so they say to him, what must we do? Well, there's something, there's something we've we're got we're to do here. We're, we're not quite sure what it is. Please help us. What is it that we must do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. Jesus comes back to them and he says, all right, if that's the the." terminology you want to use I'll help you this is the work that you are to do the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent that your confidence might be in Christ that your eyes might be set upon Christ and that everything might depend upon him Jesus, Messiah, Christ, Anointed One, let Him be absolutely all in all. You want to know what you're to do? Believe in Him. Believe in the Son of God who has come into this world at the bidding of His Heavenly Father. Some people will say, that's not work. Sometimes believing is, sometimes the decision, sometimes the stand that needs to be taken. Sometimes it is very definitely work. But this is what we are to do. This is the work Christ calls us to, that we might look to the Son of God and believe in Him. Jesus and the Father understands who we are is it not true that there are times when we itch to be active and to have an occupation for these hands and these feet these lips to be doing something in our salvation there is nothing we must receive it as a free gift of God by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God lest any man should boast boasting is excluded boasting is utterly eliminated it is done however once we have this standing once we come to know our Lord and Savior and we rejoice in what he has done for us and the gift that he has extended to us so kindly but at such great cost. We then come to these four, let us, based upon our standing in Christ, not in order to obtain that standing, but because we already have it, let us, first of all, verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith now during a time of covid drawing near is utterly the last thing that people are counseling but here christ he invites us to draw near and the writer he impels us and he commands us that this is the right thing to do to draw near to our lord and savior with a sincere heart fully confident, fully assured that what He has done has been effective. That the cleansing which He provided was what was needed and did what was intended to do. We've been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Therefore, we have the privilege, we have the opportunity, we have the joy of drawing near and ever pressing closer and closer to our Lord. That's number one. Number two, 
let us, and this is in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering because the one who has promised us this is faithful. Let us hold fast. It's not that we just casually hold this in our hands with open hands. We grab a hold of the Word of God and we hold to the promises of God. And though all the world calls us fools, yet we hold to the promises and the, pres- the promises of God and we rejoice in every last one of them. Let us hold fast. You remember Abraham, that he was coming on to a hundred years of age, and the promise of God was that he would have a son, not by Hagar, but by Sarah. Others surely called him a fool for thinking as he did and trusting that God would fulfill his word. In Romans, Paul tells us about Abram, that he considered his own body, yet he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. Here, the same is pressed for us. Just as Abraham held fast to the promises of God, and he held on to that hope without wavering. Why? Because God was the one who had promised that he would fulfill his word. And and, and Abraham just trusted in God's word and God credited it to him as righteousness. So first of all, let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Second of all, verse 24 now. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We go from the vertical, our relationship with the Lord, drawing near to Him and holding fast to His Word, not letting it go. We now come and we consider, what about that sister over there or that brother over there? Let us consider how to stimulate and to encourage them to love and to good deeds. We are reminded that just as the starting point of this was, therefore, brethren, we are a part of the family of God. We are a part of the body of Christ. We are not individuals who have a direct connection with God alone. We are a part of those round about us. and We are accountable for one another. And so we are to care and we are to look about us We are to consider. Then one more, verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but, and here's where I add in these two words, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day appearing. Not forsaking are assembling together as is the habit of some. It was back in January that I laid out, or perhaps it was at the end of last year that I laid out the course of this study through Hebrews, and I knew that it would take us a good while, perhaps a year or so, in order to fully make our way through this excellent book. But I had no idea whatsoever that on this day, I would be preaching to you about assembling together, even as we are in the midst of COVID, and tomorrow there are greater restrictions on us meeting together than there have been for a while. Let me bring something to your attention for your consideration. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, And verse 16, Moses was commanded by God to instruct the people three times in a year, all your males, all the Jewish men, 
shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. That was Jerusalem. And it says here, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So three times each calendar year, every Jewish male who was at all able to go up, who was not on a distant journey, though some did travel very considerable distances, three times a year, Jerusalem would swell immensely at these times of festival and at these times of feast. But we think about how that, that worked well for some decades and even centuries. Then comes the Babylonian exile. You remember those 70 years, and right at that time we have such great prophets as Daniel and Ezekiel, both of them right there in Babylon. They weren't able to go up to Jerusalem three times a year. It was simply not possible for them to do so. Others were the ones who made the decisions for them, and they did what they could to honor God. Daniel, of course, he continued to pray and to call on God for His mighty power. And he even in the midst of those days when he was tested, he continued to pray even though the lion's den was the threat and he was thrown there. Ezekiel, he continues to meet with the people and to speak God's Word to them and to call them to righteousness and to holiness. Were they wrong in what they did? Were they disobedient in what God was asking of them, what He had commanded in the law three times a year to go up to Jerusalem and there to worship? We need to consider that God was yet with His people. God was there with Daniel as he met to pray. God was with him in the lion's den, closing the mouths of those vicious beasts. He was with Ezekiel as you read the visions that Ezekiel had and the messages that he conveyed to the people. Here we are considering not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. Should this be something that we use to beat upon those who are noticeably absent from our gathering? I think not. I think that would most definitely lack charity. There are many for whom it is impossible for them to come because to do so would be a tremendous threat to their own well-being. I would want you to see what is the intent of verse 25 and the fourth, let us. It is, let us encourage one another. That doesn't necessarily have to be in a gathering of this sort, although I trust there is rich encouragement in singing the songs which we sing in reading the Scriptures together and in praying and in hearing God's Word proclaimed. But it does not simply come from that. We need to encourage one another and we need to consider how it is that in various ways we might be a blessing and a strength and encouragement, a means of growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through these very unusual times. Yes, indeed, we take advantage of every opportunity that is afforded to us, but I would not wish to use this as a club. Encourage one another. Let us encourage, richly encourage one another. Earlier in the time of this pandemic, I think that I made greater emphasis to you to be by mail, by
by phone, by text, by email, by whatever opportunity to be blessing and to be encouraging one another. Let me encourage you again, someone who you haven't seen for a while. Why don't you phone them up, make that contact with them, let them know that they are being thought of and prayed for and encourage them. And the concluding verse is, and all the more as you see the day. There was one great day in the first century Christians' lives that they were looking to, and it was the day when Jesus Christ would come back, even as it is said at the beginning of Acts, when the disciples are gathered and Jesus is lifted up, and the angel comes and says, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here? This same Jesus whom you have just seen taken away will so come in like manner. They had work to do. There was a task to be accomplished. There was a witness to be born. But every day, the believers looked and they wondered, could this be the day that we will see our Lord once again? And it was for joy of that day that they endured all that they did endure. And many of them were most horribly treated. We are told all the more. All the more should we draw near. All the more should we hold fast. All the more should we be pressing and praying, considering how that we might encourage and stimulate and prod one another to love and to good deeds and encourage one another in every possible way as we see the day, the day that is certainly drawing near and that will soon be here. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for how that you have created us and how that sometimes we get fidgety. Lord, it was only right and proper because of our temptation to boast and to brag that the work of salvation be absolutely none of our doing. But Lord, we thank You that You have yet called us to occupy until You come. You yet call us to be about the Master's business. You call us to these things which we are told here in the middle of Hebrews chapter 10. May we be faithful at our post. May we be about, indeed, about the Master's business and what You have assigned to us. Where You have assigned us, Lord. So may we be found faithful and ever exalting, ever glorifying the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.